MIT. And then uh, started in Chicago, where he did his undergrad, and then moved to the West Coast um, at Caltech for grad school, where he switched to the better side of astrophysics uh, from cosmology, where, which is what he started in. Um, and then moved up the coast to Santa Barbara, and then Berkeley, and now he's an assistant professor at MIT. Uh, he does a lot of work on compact object tides, and say he's going to talk about uh, the neutron star aspect of that. So. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, enjoying my visit today. Um, so let's see. So, uh, so this drawing here is, uh, is an artist. Uh, 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 a creation of uh, what's supposed to be two neutron stars that are in-spiraling and are about to merge. And uh, the reason they're in-spiraling is because uh, of these gravitational waves, so these ripples in space-time uh, that are emitting. And these gravitational uh, waves remove energy and angular momentum from the orbit. And um, as a result, the orbit decays. And so uh, if you want to calculate the rate of orbital decay, uh, to a first approximation, you can just treat these two neutron stars as point masses, uh, and you do pretty well in, in calculating the, um, the orbital decay rate. Um, but of course, neutron stars are not point masses. They have a finite size, and so there's also tidal interactions between these objects. Um, and so tides are also going to be, um, are also going to um, take energy and angular momentum out of the orbit uh, and modify the rate of in-spiral uh, to some extent. Uh, and so the question I'm interested in is uh, how important are ties in these systems? To what extent do they modify uh, the in-spiral compared to the assumption of two-point masses? Um, so I'll start with sort of a, a, a broad overview of gravitational waves uh, in the context of neutron star binaries. Uh, and then I'll start talking about tides in sort of a general sense. Uh, so I'll start with uh, what I'll call linear tides. Uh, and so if you imagine you have a binary system and the secondary raises a tide on the primary and the tidal amplitude is delta r, then if you're talking about linear tides, you take the fluid equations and perturb them to linear order in delta r over r, right? And that's going to be uh, roughly equal to the mass ratio of the binary times the ratio of the radii to the third power. Uh, so then after talking a bit about linear tides, I'll talk about work I've been doing um, on weakly nonlinear ties where you keep essentially the next order term in perturbation theory. Uh, so you keep terms to order delta r over r squared. Uh, and so I'll you know, talk a bit about the kinds of physics that comes in when you, when you uh, start talking about nonlinear ties. Um, so then I'll you know, apply this, uh, uh, these, these different title descriptions uh, to the problem of neutron star binaries. Uh, and um, uh, all previous studies uh, uh, have only have pretty much only assumed that the linear tide is important. They've, uh, in effect, ignored nonlinear effects. Um, and so, uh, after talking about the linear uh, results, I'll start talking about work I've been doing on nonlinear tides. And um, you know, the question isn't so much, uh, you know, are nonlinear effects important? Because, of course, since these things are in spiraling, at some point in the in spiral. Uh, nonlinear effects are going to become important. You know, one of the neutron stars is going to be uh, tidally shredded, and so of course, uh, you know, nonlinear um, uh, dynamics are going to play an important role at that point in the in the inspiral. So the question isn't so much whether they're important, but rather when. You know, when during the inspiral they uh, do they become important, and do they have, uh, in particular, an effect that's detectable by ground-based observatories uh, such as LIGO. Um, you know, is it only in the very, very last stages of inspiral that nonlinear effects are important, or is it sometime uh, sooner? So that's the kind of question I'm, I'm interested in. Um, okay, so, uh, so gravitational waves are ripples in space-time. Uh, they're transverse waves that uh, propagate at the speed of light. Uh, and if you have two freely floating masses and a gravitational wave passes by, uh, it's going to push them uh, apart and together at the gravitational wave frequency. Um, and so. Uh, they have not yet been directly detected, uh, so I won't say anything about BICEP2, which uh, uh, you know, may or may not be, uh, 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 have detected gravitational waves. Um, uh, but while they haven't been directly detected, uh, observatories such as LIGO and Virgo 
uh, are hoping to basically see uh, the displacement of two freely floating masses. Basically, the masses in their case are mirrors, and they're shining laser lights between these mirrors to measure uh, their distances to extremely high accuracy. And so they, um, they are currently in an upgrading phase and expect to be sensitive to gravitational waves from uh, compact object binaries um, sometime, hopefully, within the next couple of years. Um, okay, so while they haven't yet been directly detected, there is indirect uh, evidence of gravitational waves. And the sort of classic example of this is from the Hulse-Taylor pulsar. Uh, so this is a uh, binary system containing two neutron stars, one of which is a pulsar. Uh, it was discovered by Hulse and Taylor in, in the mid-70s. And because one of the neutron stars is a pulsar, you can do precision timing of the system and uh, measure all sorts of general relativistic effects. Um, and so here is, uh, is one of the effects. Um, so this is a plot of the cumulative change in the orbital period in seconds as a function of years since discovery. So you know, the first data point is, is around 1975. Uh, and you know, the last data point on this plot is, is you know, early 2000s. Um, this would extend you know, down to here now uh, in 2014. And uh, the points are the measurements of the change in orbital periods so over you know, this 30-year baseline. Uh, the orbit has changed. Uh, the cumulative change has been something like 35 seconds. Uh, and so then you have this line that goes exactly through all these points. right? And these, you know, these, this line is not a fit to the points. Right? It's the prediction of general relativity uh, accounting for orbital decay due to the emission of gravitational waves. Uh, and so uh, the implication of this, uh, of this measurement is that, uh, that we're, you know, uh, we're seeing gravitational wave losses that are uh, consistent with GR's prediction to, uh, you know, to better than a part in 100. OK. So, um, so, the, uh, so what are some sources of gravitational waves? And so the, you know, for these ground-based observatories, uh, coalescing neutron star, neutron star, neutron star black hole, and black hole, black hole binaries are considered to be the most promising sources. Um, and so what LIGO is going to see is something like the last 10,000 orbits before the merger. Um, and so that takes about five minutes, so it's seeing the last five minutes of the life of, of, of one of these binaries. Uh, and in that time, the orbital frequency goes from something like 10 hertz to 1,000 hertz. Uh, and so that's kind of illustrated in this cartoon here. You have um, an in-spiral phase. Uh, and then you have, eventually, a merger and ring down. Um, so this is the gravitational wave signal that, that LIGO would hope to detect. Um, and so you know, people are uh, actively you know, building these detectors and upgrading them. Uh, uh, you know, with a, the hope of having, by having many of them, you, you know, improve your sensitivity and detection confidence and also are able to, you know, localize on the sky exactly where your source is. And so there's two LIGO observatories in the U.S. that um, are currently in this uh, um, upgrading phase where they're going to reach design sensitivity, sensitivity that can potentially detect uh, uh, in spiral. Uh, and then, you know, coming online somewhat later are these other observatories. Um, so, right, so, uh, so this upgrade known as Advanced LIGO is supposed to come online uh, next year or so, and it's going to be 10 times more sensitive than the previous incarnation of LIGO. Um, and because uh, it's 10 times more sensitive, it actually can survey 1,000 times more volume of the universe. So uh, that's illustrated here. So this little circle is, is uh, the initial LIGO, and this big circle uh, is, is advanced LIGO. And so the, you know, there's many more uh, you know, clusters of galaxies within the volume that it's sensitive to. Uh, and so you know, if you estimate the rates at which these, uh, these events happen within that volume, uh, you find that um, you should see something of order, you know, tens per year uh, of, of neutron star, neutron star, neutron star black hole binaries. Um, and of course, there's, you know, a lot of uncertainty in exactly what that rate is. Uh, we only know of something like 10 neutron star binaries, um, you know, that we have to extrapolate from to, uh, to shorter orbital periods. Uh, you could also use some population synthesis estimates. Um, and so all those get folded into these, these, uh, these uncertainties. Uh, but, you know, the sort of uh, the most likely scenario is something like one per week or so. Um, okay. And so, 
uh, an important aspect of the, of the detection is that because there's a lot of noise in the detectors, you have to do um, something known as match filtering to pull the signal out of the noise. And so you know, this is the signal that you'd like to see, uh, but this, uh, the gray, is all the noise from, from various uh, um, you know, aspects of the, of the design, thermal noise and, um, uh, and such. And you have to be able to you know, find this tiny signal in this noise. And so the way uh, the way uh, they're going to do that is by essentially creating a large set of model waveforms uh, for a range of different parameters, different masses of the binaries, different uh, distances and spins and so on, and uh, basically do, uh, you know, convolve the noisy data with these templates to, uh, to find, uh, to, you know, to pull the signal out of that noise. Um, and so an important point uh, of my talk today is that today, um, when building these waveform templates, uh, people have assumed that you can treat the neutron stars as point masses. Right? Um, you know, so the, the, the sort of uh, models that they've created have all assumed that, that you can treat these two neutron stars as point masses. And so the question then is, uh, what about tides? Why have they concluded that you don't have to uh, um, include tides or tidal effects? Um, so that brings me to my next part of my talk, uh, the linear theory of tides. Uh, and so it's nice to sort of start with a classical tidal system, the Earth-Moon system, uh, slightly exaggerated. Uh, and so you have the moon raising a tide on the Earth's, uh, you know, mostly oceans. And um, because the Earth spins uh, faster than the moon orbits, uh, the tidal bulge leads the moon's orbit. All right, so you can sort of think of uh, you know, the, oceans, uh, the, the, the ocean floor uh, dragging the, the fluid with it and the moon dragging it back. But because the Earth spins in a day and the or moon orbits in a month, uh, the, the bulge leads the moon's orbit. Uh, and so if you now decompose the forces acting on the moon, uh, most of it points to the center of the Earth, but there's, of course, a component pointing to the tidal bulge. Uh, so then there's an R cross F force. There's a torque that... Um, that removes uh, angular momentum from the Earth's spin and gives it to the Moon's orbit. And so as a result, uh, the Earth's spin slows down by something like two milliseconds per century, and the Moon moves away from us at something like one nanometer per second. Uh, so that's roughly the rate at which your fingernails grow, a nanometer per second. So, uh, so this guy here is illustrating how far the Moon has moved from us in the last 15 years. <laughs> um, and, uh, and actually, the, you know, the Apollo astronauts put mirrors on the Moon's on the, on the moon, and um, we can now shine lasers at those mirrors and uh, from these lunar ranging experiments, measure the distance to the moon to centimeter accuracy. Um, and so they're actually at the point where they're so accurate that they need to you know, account for where on the mirror they actually, the laser light struck. You know, so they need to understand the structure of the mirror and how it's oriented relative to Earth in order to, to make, make these measurements now. Um, that's how accurate they are. Um, OK, so suppose uh, instead you have say, a neutron star black hole system, and the neutron star is slowly rotating. So say the black hole is orbiting at a frequency of 10 hertz, and the neutron star is spinning at 1 hertz. Um, so now the tidal bulge is going to lag the black hole's um, orbit, and, um, and as a result, the black hole will inspiral faster than it would otherwise if there wasn't tides, right? and the neutron star is going to get spun up. Um, and so, in other words, the tide speeds up the rate of inspiral. It removes energy and angular momentum from the orbit compared to the point mass result. And so then there's, as a result, an orbital phase error um, that accumulates over the course of the inspiral. You know, so you can calculate you know, how, many, um, uh, how many orbits before merger, and you're going to find fewer orbits um, than you would if it was just a point mass. So, for example, instead of seeing 10,000 orbits, uh, LIGO might only see 9,999, right? And so that might sound like a tiny difference, you know, part in 10 to the 4, but that's sort of the level at which we need to, you know, understand tidal effects um, because that's the, the level at which LIGO is going to be sensitive. The waveforms from LIGO are going to, you know, be able to see differences in, in, in phase of order or radian or so over, you know, over the 10,000. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, if you ask, you know, how do tides influence the inspiral, 
there's essentially you know, two components to, to that calculation. Um, one is just the amplitude of the tide. Um, so I'll uh, refer to that amplitude as uh, that, that, that tidal bulge, this sort of you know, um, uh, quadrupolar shape here as the equilibrium tide. And so that equilibrium tide has been calculated uh, to, to very high accuracy you know, using you know, the you know, realistic neutral star models. So you know, we don't really know what the equation of state is. So people have done it for uh, different equations of states and including you know, higher order um, relativistic effects, post-Newtonian effects, um, to calculate you know, exactly what that amplitude is. And um, the other thing that influences the, the importance of tides is the lag angle, right? how big this delta is. And that lag angle has essentially just two contributions. Um, one is from just the orbital decay due to gravitational radiation. So the neutron star is not going to point exactly at the black hole um, just because that black hole is, is decaying due to gravitational radiation. Um, and so that's going to scale as something like one over the decay time uh, uh, of the system. The other source uh, of lag angle is the viscosity of the star, right? And so uh, the more viscous the star is, the harder it is, it, the harder time it has to keep up with the uh, the orbiting uh, companion. And so that's going to scale as one over the viscous time. And so when people have done linear calculations, uh, they've always found that this viscous lag angle um, is much much less than this gr. Uh, lag angle, this orbital decay lag angle, um, because essentially the you know they find that uh, the neutron star has you know very low viscosity. This is sort of a long wavelength perturbation, and so uh, this viscous time scale is, is very long. Uh, and so the conclusion of these these linear tide calculations um, has been to essentially you know say you can ignore this viscous lag angle and just focus on refining the calculation of delta gr. Right, and so including higher order post Newtonian effects and so on. Um, so that's sort of the, you know, this, the, the the state of the art now is to calculate, um, you know, these two things to um, a higher precision, include the effects of spin, for example. Um, and so, you know, of course, since, you know, the uh, the effect tides might have on the inspiral is uh, is something that that. Um, could potentially be important for the detection of gravitational waves from these systems. You know, people have thinking about this have been thinking about this problem for for a long time. Um, you know, dating back to the early 90s. Um, and what you know these calculations have all found um, is that, um, in effect, advanced LIGO is um, is unlikely to uh, be sensitive to uh, the effects of tides. Right. And so this is really the, you know, this, the, these results were the basis for using the point mass approximation when constructing the waveform, temp, waveform templates for this match filtering technique. Um, and so this, uh, you know, this conclusion is illustrated in this plot here from a paper by, uh, by Tanya Hinderer and her collaborators. So what's plotted is the tidal love number of, uh, of a neutron star. And so that love number is related to uh, the amplitude of the tide, this delta R over R. Um, and it's also related to something known as the apsidal motion constant, um, if you're familiar that from, uh, with that from uh, you know, stellar binary systems. Uh, so it's plotted, you know, plotting this, you know, the tidal love number as a function of mass of the neutron star for different equations of state. Right? So we don't know what the relation is between pressure and density in the core of neutron stars where the densities are supernuclear. And so we you know, only can construct you know, ideas, models for, for how matter behaves in those extreme regimes. And so, uh, these are different uh, equations of state, and uh, the the point is that uh, advanced LIGO is sensitive to anything in the white region, so everything to the left of this dashed line. And you know, if you look at uh, what the masses are, uh, they're all you know sort of less than a, a solar mass, and and most of them are are significantly less than a solar mass. You know, whereas all the neutron stars that we know about are you know, 1.5 solar masses, two solar masses. Uh, and so the, you know, the implication is that, uh, you, know, for, uh, you know, for at least the neutron stars that we know about, tides are not going to be um, uh, detectable with advanced LIGO. Uh, the other conclusion uh, of these linear calculations is that 
uh, that the tidal heating of the neutron star, right, the energy you take out of the orbit and put it into, neut into the neutron star, is fairly neg negligible. Uh, the temperatures can get up to 10 to the 8 degrees, but that's, um, that's not significant uh, um, you know, for a neutron star. How does that depend on depth in the crust? Um, yeah, so, so there's calculations people have done, um, have shown that you can potentially uh, excite uh, uh, resonantly excite modes, you know, at the interface between the crust and the core, um, and those can potentially reach much higher temperatures than this. So this is the core temperature. Yeah. No. So this is this is going to be core G modes that that excite, and so that's mostly in the core. Yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, so of course, uh, you know, there's people here who do numerical simulations of, uh, of mergers between neutron stars and, uh, and either black holes or other neutron stars. Um, and so they, you know, these hydrodynamic simulations account for you know, nonlinear effects to all orders. Um, and so um, uh, in principle, at least, they would be able to you know, say whether uh, or when nonlinear effects become important. Um, the problem is, is that because these are such numerically taxing calculations, um, you can only really simulate the last 10 orbits or so before merger. Um, so these are you know, at gravitational wave frequencies above you know, 300 or 400 hertz. Uh, and the, the problem is, is that by the, you know, the time you're at these very high frequencies, the system is already highly nonlinear. Right? And so uh, this is a, a plot from, from one of these papers where you know, this is the initial uh, uh, condition of the system. And you see that the, the two neutron stars are already um, highly distorted. And there's already um, you know, some mass transfer going on. And so the, the system is already in a highly nonlinear state um, at the start of the simulation. Um, and so the, you know, you know, the question I'm interested in is really when does the linear approximation break down? Uh, it certainly has broken down by you know, 400 hertz, um, but what about at 50 hertz? What about at 10 hertz? Is, is the linear approximation that people have been assuming uh, still good at those lower frequencies? Um, okay, so that brings me to work I've been doing on, uh, on nonlinear tides. Um, so again, basically what we're doing is a perturbation theory of the fluid equations and expanding to, uh, to the lowest nonlinear um, order to delta r over r squared. Uh, and when you start, uh, so at, at linear order, if you imagine you have waves excited on the star, um, those waves don't interact with each other. They pass right through each other. Um, but when you start working to second order, you have wave-wave interactions, right? And so just to be clear, when I say wave-wave uh, interactions, I'm talking about fluid waves, right, not gravitational waves. Um, and so an example of the kind of wave-wave interaction that you can, ha that you can have at uh, at second order is, is the following. So suppose you have um, a parent wave, and that parent wave might be uh, this tidal bulge itself, this um, long wavelength perturbation to the star. Right? And so that parent wave can nonlinear ex excite pairs of daughter waves. Right? Um, and in you know, the sort of conventional uh, picture that people have of, uh, of three-mode coupling, they often talk about a parametric instability in which the uh, the parent wave's frequency is equal to the, or almost exactly equal to the sum of the daughter wave frequencies, right? So there's some sort of resonant uh, coupling between the daughters and the parent. Um, and the, you know, the important uh, point about when you work to second order is that uh, there's a new source of damping in the system, right? In linear theory, you know, this parent wave can only damp by some sort of linear damping process. But now it can also lose energy by exciting these, uh, these daughter waves. Um, and so that means there's, uh, uh, you know, there's a potential for increasing this viscous lag angle relative to the prediction of linear theory right? by exciting these, uh, these daughter waves and losing energy to them. Um, OK, so uh, to sort of illustrate how this uh, sort of interaction can, can take place, uh, let's imagine that we just have uh, uh, three waves in our system. And to begin with, let's imagine there's no coupling uh, between the parent wave and the uh, daughter wave. So we're just you know, thinking about the linear tide. And so imagine we start the parent wave at some sort of zero uh, or very low energy and excite it um, 
through uh, uh, you know, linear resonant interaction with the tides. So imagine this parent is, is, has a f frequency comparable to the tidal driving frequency. So it gets driven up to some energy. Uh, and if I extended this plot all the way to the right, it would you know, reach some sort of uh, linear equilibrium and just sort of sit there at the linear energy. Um, OK, so that was without three-wave interactions. So now let's turn on three-wave interactions and ask what happens. Um, and so what happens is that once the parent crosses some critical energy, uh, it becomes unstable to the excitation of these daughter waves. And so these daughter waves get driven to, uh, to a large energy um, and undergo some sort of complicated limit cycle interaction with the parent wave. Uh, and the parent wave, uh, rather than ever approaching its linear energy, uh, basically just sort of sits at, at a much lower energy, something close to the critical energy. Um, and so the, you know, the implication is that when you include these three of interactions, um, uh, you know, these daughters, which in linear theory would basically have zero energy, can get excited to some large energy. And the parent uh, doesn't quite reach this linear energy. And so that, you know, at the very least, can change the, um, the tidal dissipation rate relative to, the, uh, to what you would get if you just did linear tides. So, so to what extent does the time the frequency of the wave play a role? Um, well, I think it's important to understand that the parent wave has a time dependent frequency in this situation. Uh, so the parent wave has its natural frequency, and it's being driven linear, resonantly by a, 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 a tidal frequency. Um, okay, and so if you want to, you know, evaluate the importance of these three wave interactions, you know, one of the, uh, you know, one of the steps is to calculate the coupling coefficient. You know, how strongly um, does this parent wave interact uh, with these daughter waves? So you sort of think of, in a, terms of a Feynman diagram, you know, you want to calculate the, the strength of this vertex here, which is um, parameterized by something known as a coupling coefficient, um, which I'll symbolize by uh, kappa and the subscripts ABC. So A um, is the parent wave, and B and C are the daughter waves. Um, and so uh, this coupling coefficient is going to determine that critical energy above which the parent, um, in our case, the, the equilibrium tide, um, is nonlinearly unstable to daughter modes. Um, and so you know, people have. You know, in these linear studies, people, um, in some cases, argued that um, that you could ignore um, nonlinear effects because delta R over R, the amplitude of the tide, was you know very small, you know, uh, much less than one, until um, very high frequencies. Um, and so, you know, the sort of argument is that if delta R over R is small, then delta R over R squared terms are even smaller, and you can ignore them. Uh, they can only be a very tiny correction. Um, but the issue is that this isn't actually a good way of measuring the importance of nonlinear effects. Um, you know, in order to evaluate the importance of nonlinear effects, you need to know what the coupling coefficient is. So you know, in, in particular, if, if the coupling coefficient is large, nonlinear effects can be important even if delta R over R is small. Right. So then, of course, the question is, what is um, what is kappa for a neutron star? Um, and so, uh, so I won't you know, go into detail of, of how to, um, how to cal calculate kappa. It involves you know, integrals over the eigenfunctions um, uh, of the parent and daughters. Uh, but you know, the, the, the point I want to make is that it can be large if the wavelengths of the two modes, rough, uh, of the two daughters, are nearly equal. So if the wavelength of daughter B is approximately equal to um, the wavelength of daughter C, um, the coupling can be strong. Um, and uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on the coupling of P modes to G modes. Um, and I'll say exactly what P modes and G modes are in a second. Um, and the reason I'm going to focus on, on these types of, of modes is because um, we find that such coupling is especially strong. Uh, the coupling between these modes is especially strong in neutron stars. Um, and so I'll start by focusing on uh, three-mode coupling, and then I'll discuss higher-order couplings, uh, like four-mode coupling. OK, so, uh, so stars can support various types of internal waves. Uh, and so three of them are listed here. So 
uh, a P mode, uh, so the P stands for pressure, so it's a pressure wave or a sound wave, an acoustic wave. Uh, and so P modes all have short periods, periods less than the dynamical time of the star. Uh, so a famous example of a P mode is the five minute oscillation of the sun. Uh, G modes are, so the G stands for gravity, so they're gravity waves, not to be confused with gravitational waves, so they're you know, waves in a fluid, um, and they're supported by buoyancy pressure, uh, buoyancy force, um, and they all have uh, periods that are long, longer than a dynamical time. Uh, and you know, an important aspect of G modes in the context of tides is that because they have long periods, uh, they can be resonant with the tidal frequency. The tidal frequency is, of course, going to have uh, um, is going to be um, less than the dynamical frequency, um, and so therefore these G modes can be resonant with it. Um, uh, and finally, uh, there's inertial modes, modes in which the Coriolis force is the restoring force. Um, um, and they have typically periods that are of order, the spin period, uh, you know, for our purposes, I'm just going to ignore inertial modes. Okay, so, um, so thinking about tides uh, coupling to uh, modes within a neutron star, uh, this coupling can be strong um, if, uh, between a P mode and G mode, if the wavelengths are approximately equal. And so if you want to know what that, uh, you know, what this implies about the modes that are coupled to each other, uh, you can look at the dispersion relation of P modes and G modes. Uh, so the dispersion relation of a P mode, this is just an acoustic wave, you know, so it's, you know, um, frequency is equal to wave number times sound speed, um, so that's, that's that relation here. Um, and then the, the dispersion relation for G modes is uh, their wavelength over 2 pi is equal to their frequency times R divided by um, a buoyancy frequency, a brunt weissaller frequency of the, uh, of the star um, times a, uh, a factor lambda, where um, lambda is related to the spherical harmonic index um, through this relation. Right. And so, uh, you know, if you use these dispersion relations and set these two things equal to each other, uh, you find that uh, the equilibrium tide can couple strongly to a short wavelength P mode and G mode uh, if they uh, satisfy this relation. So if the product of the P mode frequency and G mode frequency is approximately equal to um, this uh, factor on the right. Uh, and so the factor on the left is just uh, a property of the modes. It's independent of radius in the star. Whereas the factor on, uh, on the right is in general going to be a function of radius in the star, right? The buoyancy frequency, the sound speed um, can all be functions of, of radius within a star. Um, but the important point is that in a neutron star, uh, that's uh, this, this critical factor, NCS over R, is actually nearly constant over a very large region. Um, and so that's illustrated in this plot here. So what I've done is uh, I've taken a uh, a neutron star model that's 1.4 solar masses and use the skirm leone equation of state, uh, which gives a radius of something like 11.7 kilometers. And you know, this result is, uh, is, is, is gonna be true of any equation of state um, you can show. And, and so what I've plotted here is this neutron star as a function, uh, you know, different parameters in the neutron star as a function of radius. Uh, so we have sound speed, uh, density, a buoyancy frequency, and in the solid line, I have that critical uh, factor n, the buoyancy frequency times the sound speed divided by r, uh, and you see that over, um, you know, more than half of the star, the this factor is almost perfectly constant, right? And this is essentially, uh, you know, this isn't some something really odd. It's really just a consequence of the fact that the neutron star core is extremely stiff and has nearly constant density, and so you can show that. For a nearly constant density core, uh, this factor is going to be um, uh, a constant, and it just uh, you know the core of a neutron star is just big. Um, and so what this means is that there's a large region, you know, maybe the inner half of the neutron star, where uh, the coupling between the P mode and G mode and the tide can be large, where this coupling coefficient can be large. Um, and so that's illustrated in, um, for a particular set of modes uh, in this plot here. Um, so let's see, so the, the solid line, uh, the solid oscillating line is the, uh, is the structure of a P mode uh, within the neutron star. Uh, the dashed line is a G mode, 
and you can see that the two uh, overlap almost perfectly over you know 60 percent of the neutron star and so then this solid line is the cumulative integral of the coupling coefficient between the equilibrium tide and this uh, p mode g mode pair uh, and so you can see that over you know the 60 percent of the star the coupling coefficient um, has a has a net uh, you know, a net positive contribution to it, and so it can be large. Um, okay, so then, you know, we've established that the coupling coefficient can be large, and then what we want to do is know what's the instability criteria um, for the system. Um, and so, typically, when people talk about three-mode coupling, they focus on res resonant interactions, this parametric instability I mentioned, uh, where, you know, the sum of the daughter frequencies adds up to roughly the parent's frequency. Um, but here, if we're talking about coupling of P modes to G modes and the tide, uh, because the P modes have such high frequency, uh, their, you know, their frequency is much higher than the G mode frequency and the tidal frequency, uh, the sum of the daughter wave frequencies is much higher than the tidal frequency. And so this is going to be a non-resonant interaction, so very different from a parametric instability. Um, but you can still show that, um, that such non-resonant interactions um, can be unstable if the coupling is sufficiently strong. So if the coupling coefficient is greater than one over the parent's amplitude, um, in our case, it would be one over delta R over R. Uh, if the coupling coefficient is that large, uh, a non-resonant daughter pair will be unstable. Okay, I'll skip that. Uh, okay, so then uh, we have the amplitude of the parent. Uh, we have a coupling strength which we can calculate, and so you can evaluate the instability criteria, and this is, uh, uh, and, and, and express it in terms of, you know, at what frequency, what gravitational wave frequency um, is the equilibrium tide unstable to this kind of coupling. Uh, and what you find is that at frequencies above around 25 hertz, uh, the equilibrium tide becomes unstable. And so this is roughly the frequency at which uh, a system first enters LIGO's bandpass. Um, and what it implies is that the linear approximation, which people have been um, assuming so far, uh, might be invalid much earlier in the in spiral than people had previously thought. Um, and uh, if you just account for three mode coupling uh, uh, and calculate what's the growth rate of this kind of instability, uh, you find that there's going to be something like a thousand e foldings of growth before the merger. Um, so uh, if you count just for three-mode coupling, what this would imply is that the in once the instability begins, uh, it will uh, grow until the daughter saturate. You know, a thousand e-foldings, uh, you're going to reach some sort of nonlinear saturation before, um, before the inspar, before the merger. Okay, so of course, then the question is, what about higher order terms, right? So, so far, uh, I've been focusing on three-mode coupling, which is the lowest nonlinear order in perturbation theory. Uh, but, you know, given that, uh, we're you know, talking about a non-resident interaction with uh, very large coupling uh, terms. Uh, you know, maybe higher order terms are important. Maybe perturbation theory is breaking down and uh, and you know sort of doing this perturbative analysis uh, uh, no longer applies. And so, uh, you know, in, in particular, what if uh, um, you include four-mode couplings? Can they cancel with three-mode couplings and prevent the instability? Uh, and so, just to be clear, when I say three-mode coupling, I mean coupling between the tide, a P-mode, and a G-mode. And when I say four-mode coupling, I mean coupling between the tide, the tide, a P-mode, and G-modes, coupling between the tide itself, uh, to itself, and a PG pair, or the tide itself and a G-mode pair. Uh, and so uh, a very nice paper by uh, um, uh, Teja Venumadhav, uh, Aaron Zimmerman here, and Chris Harada, um, uh, seeks to address this question of how important are four mode terms. I have this question. If you don't care about resonance, why do you have to apply the tide to the G mode? Why would that be should be the large coupling of the spiral? So so you can show that um, that the G G term in the three mode coupling, so if you think tied G G, um, that's not going to actually have a large coupling coefficient. Even though the wavelengths can match and you can even do self-coupling of the G mode, uh, the, the, uh, the strength of that coupling is actually much, much weaker than tied PG. So the, the strength of the coupling actually goes as, um, uh, for PG, essentially as the ratio of the P mode frequency to G mode frequency. 
Um, and you don't get that, that kind of ratio when it's um, GG, it's of order unity. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 um, you know, so, so it is, it is a subtle uh, thing, right? Because actually, this term, where it is GG coupling, actually is large. The fourth order GG coupling term is actually large. Um, so it's, it's definitely not something that's obvious, um, but it's something that it, that is true. Um, okay. So, uh, so let's consider uh, now four mode coupling. And let's start by making the following three assumptions. So let's assume a perfectly static tide. Um, so the driving frequency of the tide, let's just set it equal to zero. Um, this is equivalent to just thinking about the m equals zero component of the tide. Um, let's uh, ignore uh, any linear resonances between, say, a G mode in the star and the tidal driving frequency. So in other words, if you uh, ignore what's known as the dynamical tide. Uh, and also, let's ignore linear damping of waves. Uh, and so what this uh, paper um, by Venu Madhav et al. showed is that under these three assumptions, uh, the four-mode coupling between a uh, tide-tide and a G-mode pair perfectly cancels with the three-mode coupling, right? And so that perfect cam cancellation implies that this PG coupling is stable. There's no instability uh, under these three assumptions. Um, you can also uh, make an energy argument to show that uh, that given these three assumptions, that has to be the case. Um, so you can, uh, so imagine you have a tidally distorted star and you introduce a small perturbation to it, psi, uh, and you do a usual stability analysis where you assume psi goes as e to the i sigma t. Um, and so you can um, calculate the, uh, you can present, you know, make an energy argument, you can calculate the energy uh, of that perturbation. Um, and so there's going to be uh, a kinetic energy term that has uh, uh, a sigma squared uh, in it, right, where sigma again is this, is this eigenfrequency. Um, and that kinetic energy term is going to be equal to uh, a perturbed gravity piece, um, uh, an acoustic piece, and a buoyancy piece. Right? And uh, so obviously if sigma squared is negative, then, uh, then you get exponential growth, you get instability. Um, and so uh, the perturbed gravity piece, which is negative, is destabilizing, whereas this acoustic plus buoyancy piece is stabilizing. Uh, and so what you can show for, uh, for the equilibrium tide is that this piece is much, much bigger than the perturbed gravity piece, uh, which implies that you know, sigma squared is positive and therefore uh, the perturbation is stable. Right? So this is going to be you know, true to any order in, uh, in, uh, in perturbation theory. Right. Okay. So then, you know, the question becomes: Well, what if we relax these assumptions? So uh, let's first consider time-dependent forcing. So uh, the m equals plus or minus two component of the equilibrium tide. Uh, so then you can no longer use this energy argument because your background quantities, this rho and uh, and p and n, are all time-dependent. Um, and so what? Um, uh, Venu Madhav et al. did in their paper is they, uh, uh, so they considered the time dependent case and found that uh, when you account for time dependence, the cancellation between the three mode and four mode coupling is no longer exact. Right? There's some uh, slight mismatch between, between the two. Um, and as a result, uh, there is an instability. There is a, you know, this P and G mode do grow um, in the time dependent case, but they grow at some very small rate at some rate much smaller than you would find if you ignored four-mode coupling. Um, so in particular, you find that there's only, you know, instead of this thousands of e-foldings of growth, you only have a few e-foldings of growth before merger. Um, and so if, you're, you know, if your modes are starting from some tiny amplitude and you only have a few e-foldings of growth, they're not going to uh, affect the, uh, uh, the rate of tidal dissipation in the system. And they're not going to have you know, detectable effects for LIGO. Um, Okay, so uh, so what about you know uh, the assumption of uh, of uh, ignoring the linear resonant tie? So again, uh, as the binary in spirals, its frequency is going to be increasing, and it can uh, sweep through a resonance with individual G modes in the neutron star. Right? So the G modes can have frequencies that are comparable to the tidal driving frequency um, at some given moment, um, and so. 
these G modes can be then driven to some re reasonably large amplitude. And because they're coupled to uh, other P modes and G modes through the equilibrium tide, uh, by, you know, by um, the, the resonant excitation of these G modes will also drag up the P modes and G modes, right? And, and those modes can potentially also then reach large amplitudes. And so that's, um, that's illustrated in, in this plot here. So uh, it's a calculation of just a, a, a PG pair that are coupled to both, so the, they're coupled to each other through the equilibrium tide. And then the G mode is, um, undergoes a, uh, a linear resonance at a gravitational wave frequency of something like 15 hertz. So it gets driven from uh, essentially zero amplitude up to um, some amplitude here. Then you know, by, it, it doesn't keep growing because uh, the in spiral continued and it's no longer resonant with the, uh, the tidal frequency. Um, and uh, as this G mode got driven up, it dragged up a P mode with it. Uh, and then this P mode, uh, so the, the, the G mode doesn't get driven anymore, so essentially uh, 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 you know, maintains the same energy. Uh, but the P mode, which is coupled to the G mode through the equilibrium tide, uh, continues to grow because the amplitude of the equilibrium tide continues to grow um, past this uh, resonant phase. Right? So you know, the, the sort of uh, you know, question is, you know, if you, uh, you know, account for this linear resonance, is this amplitude that this P mode reaches, um, is, that, is that a significant uh, effect, does that have a significant effect on the inspiral? Well, um, so I noticed that, so the horizontal axis is basically the orbital frequency, or twice the orbital frequency? Or yes. And so you get the resonance, but then the G mode is plateauing, even when you're well outside the resonance. Why is that? Just looking at the yeah, so, so, you know, so at this point, say, right, the, so this was a, you know, a G mode with a frequency of, say, 15 hertz, natural frequency of 15 hertz. But at this point, the, the, the tidal frequency is 100 hertz. And so they're no, it's no longer being resonantly driven. Right. Uh, and so. What I don't understand, I guess, is this plateau phenomenon in the energy. Because um, I assume something about the Q of the mode. Basically, you excite the mode, and then it just keeps on ringing, and there's the weak linear damping. So there is, so I, I do, so that's actually, you can see the linear damping, so it's not perfectly flat. So there is linear damping in this calculation, but um, you know, but the main effect is that you're no longer resonantly driving, and so uh, you know it's 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 reached its uh, linear resonant energy, and, and it and it's now you know. Uh, okay, but let me ask the point. Suppose uh, you started the orbit at 30 hertz, right? Yep. Would it still reach that plateau? No. no. Okay. Yep. So you, you, you recently excited it and then it keeps on ringing. That's right. Yeah, and it, and it and oscillates at its natural frequency actually after it's been um, excited. Um, okay, and so um, so I think the, the sort of <coughs> most interesting piece of physics that, that wasn't included in the analysis of uh, this Venu Madhav paper is the linear damping of waves. And I think this might potentially have uh, a significant effect on the growth rate of these, uh, uh, of these uh, modes. And so um, let's see, so the, the modes that are unstable, the, uh, the P mode uh, and G mode, um, the G mode has a very low frequency and the P mode has a very high frequency. Uh, and in fact, the frequency of the P mode is so high that it's above what's known as the what, what's known as the acoustic cutoff frequency. So the acoustic cutoff frequency is the um, uh, is the maximum frequency a mode can have and still reflect at the surface of the star. Um, uh, physically, the uh, a mode above the acoustic frequency with a frequency higher than the acoustic cutoff um, has a wavelength that's shorter than the um, scale height of the atmosphere. And so rather than reflecting when it reaches the, uh, the surface of the star, it keeps propagating. Um, and so for a neutron star, uh, you know, there's some uncertainty, but uh, the acoustic cutoff frequency is something of order 1,000 dynamical frequencies. And so the P modes that are unstable um, have frequencies larger than this. And as a result, um, rather than reflecting at the stellar surface, they keep traveling outwards. They're outgoing traveling waves. Um, and uh, therefore have very, very high damping rates. Damping rates, uh, gamma, that are uh, basically of order the sound, uh, one over the sound crossing time uh, of, the, of the star, 
these are very short wave complaints, too. Yes. Yeah. All right, so the so the damping rate is, is one over the group travel time, which is of order the, the dynamical frequency of the star. Um, and so Yeah, so it's oh, because the frequency is many times Yeah, so so it's in the, the, the frequency is you know can be ten to the four uh that's a ten, Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so uh so it in order for uh so that, you know then the question is, you know, you might think uh if you include some large damping, right, shouldn't that decrease the growth rate, not increase it? Right, that's sort of our, our intuition that we have from, from linear theory. Um, uh, but when you start thinking in terms of the, of, of the uh, cancellation between the three mode and four mode coupling, uh, what you find is that in order for that cancellation to happen, in order to have this balance between uh, the P mode and G mode, uh, the P mode needs to stay in phase with the G mode. Um, and you need to have this uh, precise balance uh, in order to cancel these large coupling terms. Um, but if the damping rate of the P mode is very high, um, it sort of it uh, it messes with that phase balance uh, and leads to uh, enhanced growth rates. Um, so growth rates that are um, you know factors of 10 or more higher than in the undamped case. And so what that means is that you can have uh, more than 100 e foldings of growth uh, between you know when the instability turns on and the merger. Um, and so that's illustrated in this plot here. So um, I'm showing the, uh, uh, so the, bl the, the blue is the P mode and G mode um, uh, uh, energy uh, without damping. And the black is the P mode and G mode energy with damping. Uh, and so without damping, you know, there's just only a you know, small amount of growth. Um, whereas uh, with damping, um, they you know, grow by you know, 50 or more orders of magnitude. Um, and so the point is that, uh, so this is in units of binding energy of the neutron star. So you know, obviously, you know, once the mode has has a you know uh, energy of order unity, uh, you know, it's it's um, uh, it you know it'll never actually reach that energy. It'll saturate before. It. Um, so at what amplitude does the mode start? So you saw the ten to the minus forty go up to ten to the ten. That's right. But could this ten to the minus forty be ten to the minus eighteen? Yeah, so, 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 you know, so that's, that's an uncertainty, right? Um, uh, so you can actually, I mean, so, you, so the instability can start earlier too, all right? And so, um, you know, so there's, you know, there's always, there, you know, you know the, the, the hope is that there's so many E-foldings that, you know, you know, if you have 150 E-foldings as opposed to 100, then, you know, you can start at 10 to the minus 60, right, or 10 to the minus 70. So, um, you know, so there's, uh, you know, and, and, and this, if this is in, you know, units of uh, the binding energy is, you know, 10 to the 53 erg. So if you're at 10 to the minus 53, it's like, you know, mo with one erg energy. I mean, so it's, it's, it's a tiny, tiny amount of energy. And you might imagine there's just, you know, some sort of noise in the system. Uh, and the other, you know, the other, you know, you know, potential source of input energy is the linear energy, right? Is that you might be actually starting, you know, not even at 10 to the minus 50, but maybe you're starting at, you know, 10 to the minus 16 or something like that. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's a source of uncertainty. So at the same time as you're exciting shortwave length P mode, you're also exciting shortwave length P mode. I mean, I've been previous. That's right, yeah. Whoops. Yeah, so uh, so this is the, your uh, this is your shortwave length G mode. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I mean I'm, you know the, the conclusion of this you know this portion of the talk is that uh, that you know, I think there's more work that needs to be done on understanding uh, the stability of, of the P modes and G modes. I think there's reason to think, um, you know, given this linear damping effect, that uh, there might still be uh, significant growth rates. And so, uh, so, you know, what I'll now do is I'll say, suppose these P modes and G modes can reach significant amplitudes and ask the question, how does that affect uh, the in spiral? Um, and so there's basically two effects. One is that, uh, you lose energy faster than, than you would in, in, in linear theory, and so there is uh, additional phase error due to, um, due to the tide. Uh, and then there's also um, enhanced tidal heating uh, relative to linear theory. Um, and so, you know, you might ask, you know, so the question to ask is what is, 
uh, you know, this delta phi tide and the temperature uh, due to tidal heating. Um, in order to, to know what those, uh, those are, you need to basically do a saturation calculation. You need to uh, know at what energy do these driven daughters saturate. Um, and uh, the saturation is going to happen when the damping rate, due to some sort of nonlinear coupling to other modes, exceeds the driving rate by the parent, by the equilibrium tide. Uh, and so this is something we haven't done yet. Uh, it's a challenging calculation um, uh, um, and something we, you know, we'd eventually like to do. Um, uh, but you know, while we haven't done it yet, you can uh, sort of make the following, uh, you can do the following calculation. You can say, suppose the, cal the, the uh, saturation occurs by a process known as wave breaking. Uh, so, you know, we're all familiar with, with what wave breaking is as a wave approaches the shore, uh, it's, uh, it overturns and, and, and breaks. Uh, and so the condition for wave breaking is essentially that the uh, amplitude of the perturbation becomes larger than its wavelength. Um, and, you know, there's examples of G modes in the Earth's atmosphere that are propagating upwards that indeed saturate through this process. They break somewhere high up in the atmosphere. Um, and, uh, you know, so you can do the, the calculation. You can estimate the, uh, the effect of this PG instability by, uh, by asking, by, you know, assuming that the waves break, um, uh, the, the, the saturation is set by wave breaking. Um, and so, then that gives you an E dot, right, a rate of tidal dissipation given by the energy at which the wave breaks divided by uh, the growth rate of the instability. Uh, and so, um, you know, if you plug this E dot into, uh, uh, into the orbital decay and calculate the, the resulting phase error, uh, you get a phase error that, um, that is given by this expression. So, um, so it's 10 radians. Uh, with uh, a prefactor um, beta, which uh, is going to be approximately equal to one. It's basically a fudge factor, which is one if the modes saturate by breaking. Uh, so that's, that's something that's uncertain, but if, uh, if they do saturate by breaking, it's going to be one. Uh, and then it depends on uh, the number of modes that get excited n. And in principle, that number can be very large. Right? Uh, and so uh, given that you know, something like one radian is detectable uh, with LIGO and, 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 you know, is a significant shift to the standard template waveforms. Uh, you know, given that one radian is significant, you know, there's, uh, it's possible, you know, that, that this is going to be a significant effect, right? You know, there's uncertainty, of course, in beta and N, uh, but it's potentially uh, significant. What's the last factor in this? So yeah, so this is the uh, frequency of the uh, P mode, uh, which is uh, also an uncertainty. There is, you know, there is, uh, in a sense, no real upper bound. You don't know. I mean, you can you can be above the acoustic cutoff. You don't really know uh, what what the, what the what that limit is. So I just took it for some sort of. In the example you showed, you have this resonance, resonance side mode, it gives some energy, and it's nominally coupling to another mode. Yep. So right, so so here I've been, uh, you know, these past couple of slides I've been ignoring four mode coupling, right, and um, uh, and just assuming the the PG instability that with, with just three mode coupling, uh, and so that that tells me what my growth rate is. So the implication of your use the published calculation is that you get this. During the resonance. Uh, it doesn't require any resonance, right? Uh, yeah. Right. Can I go back one slide? I'm just curious. So, when you run a side greater than one, there are gravity waves in two directions, which displacement would be seen as yeah, so it's it's uh, it's k arc psi r is greater than one. So the radial wave number times the radial um, uh, eigenfunction displacement is is greater than one. 
Um, that's right, but KR is very large, it's, which is, it's actually, you know, so, so these are nearly divergenceless since they're so high frequency. So, so diff xi is almost zero, and so it's equivalent, you know, KR xi r is almost exactly equal to KH xi h, the horizontal displacement times the horizontal wave number. Um, and so, uh, you know, but those all translate. Yeah. Um, okay, and so, uh, so the other question was, you know, the, the tidal heating, and so if you, uh, if you, you know, just count again for the just three mode coupling and ask how high, uh, how much, you know, how much tidal heating there is, you find it, you know, that it can reach uh, a temperature of, you know, 10 to the 10 degrees as opposed to 10 to the 8 degrees, uh, again, with uncertainties uh, with those prefactors. Um, and so, what, you know, the implication is that the neutron star might be, uh, can be very hot before the merger. Uh, you know, which potentially has implications for things like electromagnetic counterparts and, uh, you know, the initial conditions for um, the merger calculations that people do. Um, let's see. So, uh, you know, so <coughs> I'll, I'll skip that. <laughs> uh, so I'll, let me conclude. Uh, so the, uh, you know, I think, you know, there's, there's uh, uncertainties, but I think there's still the possibility that tides might significantly influence the gravitational wave signal uh, from neutron star binaries um, at larger orbital separations than people had previously uh, thought. Uh, but there's still, you know, a lot of work left to do. So, uh, so I think the most important one is um, understanding the influence of higher order terms in perturbation theory. Um, so, you know, accounting for formal coupling and asking, uh, you know, how does this linear damping of the P mode affect the stability? How does um, this linear resonant driving of the G mode affect the, the, um, the energy that the modes reach? Um, uh, and then the, the, you know, the second step, you know, after doing the first one would be to calculate the saturation energy um, more realistically. So not just assume wave breaking, but actually do some sort of saturation calculation. Uh, and so um, uh, the sort of diagram here, illustrates, uh, you know, as a function of saturation energy, uh, what effect the instability might have uh, on, on, the, uh, on, on the waveform. Uh, so if the saturation energy is very low, uh, then it's probably okay to ignore tidal effects. Uh, if it's some sort of intermediate, then uh, you might have some sort of systematic errors in your parameter estimates if you ignore tidal effects. Um, and if it happens to be really large, if that delta phi is, you know, 100 radians or something, then, uh, then that might, you know, uh, adversely affect LIGO's ability to detect these sources if you were to ignore tidal effects. Um, and so, you know, we you know, really need to do a saturation calculation to know what, you know, the answer to these questions are. Uh, okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you. So I would say that one of the insights we tried to develop in our paper about the formal company was that this wasn't a case of one gigantic number canceling by happenstance against another gigantic number, their origins being separate, but that the whole idea of these large couplings coming in was sort of an illusion, that it's just it's the wrong perspective to take. And so from that perspective, now it seemed like what you're saying is when you add in the linear damping on the G mode and the P mode, which is different, suddenly that intuition that, that this is not really large couplings together, but some bad mode-based expansion. But that's not correct, that the old mode-based expansion is the right way to do it, and this now allows these large numbers to come back in in ways that are different. So I guess my question would be, uh, is, there, is there a sense, uh, is, is that the sense that, that the linear damping adds in, or is there sort of a way that this acoustic damping sort of should enter in, in a correct way, let's say, and, and yeah, so, not break that. Yeah, so, so there's another way of thinking about it. So if you, um, if you, uh, you know, think about the, the matrix that you use to evaluate that, you know, uh, you know, the, these nonlinear eigenvalues and adjust the stability. Um, so, you know, if you ignore damping, then you have the centrifugal term, this omega squared term, omega is the, the orbital frequency. Uh, but if you include damping, there's also a, uh, uh, omega times gamma term, right? So there's there's essentially a new there's an additional centrifugal term um, in your uh, in your matrix, um, and so um, 
you know, so in, 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 you know, in the language that you guys use in your paper, I think, you know, that would be, you know, I would say that's, you know, there's a new centrifugal term uh, that can be potentially large because uh, gamma can be much larger than omega. So the damping rate can be much larger than the orbital frequency. So how strongly does that, in the case that you're studying, spoil this cancellation, right? There should still be a partial cancellation. Yeah, so, so, the, I mean, so the growth rates are still, much, are still smaller than if you had ignored four-mode coupling. Um, you know, so, there are, uh, you know, so there's 100 E-foldings of growth, or say, but not thousands or tens of thousands. Um, so there's still, you know, there's still a lot of cancellation. So how difficult is your future work in your sketching of the suffering of work? Um, I no sense. Here. So, so this, um, so, so this is a relatively short time scale. So I've done, you know, you know, a lot of the work on the linear damping stuff, and so we're, you know, putting that, uh, we're, you know, we're sort of gearing up to, to write up a paper on that. Um, this, I don't know. <laughs> you know, so I, I have a student that's working on a similar problem um, in the context of tides raised um, by a hot Jupiter in its host star. And so there you have also a large number of modes that get excited in the, in the star, and um, there, you know, you want to know what's the saturation of, of the, uh, in this case, a parametric instability. And so uh, the hope is that, you know, uh, you know, this network that this, my student is developing for that problem can be used in this problem, too. Are there any different physical systems in a non-astrophysical system where this type of effect is established? Yeah, so, um, so I don't know of one. Um, uh, I mean, so there are, you know, these sort of, there's like buckling instabilities and, and, and um, where, um, nonlinear terms uh, are important, and there isn't any resonant interaction between, uh, you know, the buckling mode and, and, and the background. Um, so, um, you know, so I, th I, I but, but I don't know of, uh, like, you know, a specific. I haven't been able. I've, I've looked, but I haven't been able to find a specific example of, of this kind of thing. Okay. Uh, the predictions is totally dependent on the structure of the neutral star, the masses. Um, so, uh, so I think the the stability doesn't seem to be. So, you know, the the strength of the coupling, um, uh, you know, seems independent or you know not strongly dependent on the structure of the neutral star. You just need to have this. You know, this NCS over R factor be nearly constant, and um, uh, I don't know so much whether the saturation will be sensitive to the structure of the neutron star. What about the damping? I mean, that, that's really where the stability might come in. Is it the, uh, yeah. So, so that's true. So the so the acoustic cutoff frequency might depend on on the uh, on the structure of the neutron star. Um, um, so, uh, but you know, so then you could you know you you would need to consider you know, P modes with higher frequencies for um, higher acoustic cutoff frequency. Uh, 